Welcome to section 2.9. On this section, we're going to continue discussing a lot of the other organelles. We've talked about quite a few. We've talked about at least a lot of structures too. Plasma membranes, cytoplasm, or cytosol. Uh, we've talked about the nucleus, ribosomes, mitochondria, cilia, flagella. So we've talked about a fair number. But aside from the ones specific to plants, we're going to try to cover all the other ones that we're willing to go into. Uh, there can be some more you can go into that are less common, but we're going to go through most of the other common ones today. And as you can see from the picture, it's not like there's only a few of these organelles. There's quite a few. Uh, and a lot of these ones even have these subdivisions that are even more complex like we did with the nucleus. So there's a lot of complexity to the cell. So we're going to start off talking about kind of working from the nucleus out uh, the endoplasmic reticulum. And so the endoplasmic reticulum is kind of a series of these networked folded channels uh, that are contiguous with the nuclear envelope. And you'll see the rough ER tends to be usually a bit closer to the nucleus. Uh, it fluctuates, but usually you'll see that. And then the smooth is the ones that lack ribosomes that are a bit further out. And so with rough ER, it's going to be with ribosomes, whereas when we talk about smooth ER, it's going to be without. And the rough ER, because it has those ribosomes, is associated with producing proteins, uh, specifically proteins that are going to go to the surface or out of the cell. So these will be proteins that are largely for export into the cell membrane uh, or export out of the cell membrane. Now smooth ER is more associated with producing lipids. So this is useful when you're creating stuff like membrane. Uh, if the cell wants to grow, it does have to have more membrane to allow it to get bigger so it can have a bigger volume. So we do need stuff like this. And the smooth ER does some other tasks too, but they're beyond what we need. So just focus on they make lipids, uh, and then ultimately rough ER will make proteins with the help of the ribosomes that are attached to it. And then the Golgi apparatus will be this guy that looks kind of like a stack of pancakes is how I like to think of it. And I don't know if that's only when I'm hungry, but uh, to me it always just seems like that where it's away from the nucleus and there's usually several of these folds that kind of line up one next to the other and oftentimes too you'll see they kind of vary in size so it reminds me sometimes of like the stack that just you know narrows a little bit at the top with the small guy on the very peak where it looks just a tiny bit primital. Uh, and how this is going to happen is there's going to be these little membrane sacs that will carry stuff and we'll discuss them in a second uh, between the ER and the Golgi apparatus and the Golgi apparatus will be kind of like the UPS or the US Postal Service uh, if you prefer that instead of the UPS, the United Parcel Service, I believe. But it's going to process stuff a lot like it would with our mail and our packages, where it's going to bring the stuff in, it's going to label it with carbohydrates, it's going to make sure it's marked so that once it goes up and becomes part of our plasma membrane, or once it's exported from the cell, it has everything it needs to either do its job, so if we're exporting something like an enzyme or proteins to grab hold of other stuff to anchor the cell, you need to make sure it has what it needs so it won't break down, uh, you know, so it can still actually do its job, so it, it's functionally correct. So sometimes they'll fold proteins a little different, make sure the shape's right. Uh, when you add the carbohydrates, that's like the ID tag. So if it's going to go in our, our plasma membrane or cell membrane here, we want to make sure that when the blood cells, white blood cells come through, they recognize it as one of our cells. And so it just kind of makes sure everything's modified, packaged, and set. And then it puts it in another vesicle, another little membrane sac, and then sends it to the surface of the cell. And so once it reaches the surface, the membrane of this little sac is going to merge. And so the membrane of the sac, called the vesicle, is going to become part of our plasma membrane. And anything inside of that vesicle is going to be sent out of the cell. And so this is a useful way to get a lot of stuff that's it's fairly large in size, to get waste out of the cell, uh, or to just secrete stuff like enzymes that we want to get out of there. Uh, if you're like a fungus, oftentimes they can secrete stuff like antibiotics to try and attack bacteria that could mess with them or compete with them. So there's lots of different reasons we have for trying to get stuff into the membrane or out of the membrane. And you know, growth, transport, uh, digestion of stuff, uh, competition, all those can be part of it. Now, we talked about these vesicles. So I want to go just a little bit more into them. Vesicles are one of the simplest of organelles, where it's just a single phospholipid membrane. It's small, and there's just something specific inside. Now, for transport membranes, those guys are just going to go from the ER to the Golgi apparatus and from the Golgi apparatus to the plasma membrane. Uh, transport vesicles can also take things just from one part of the cell to the other. 
but in our case we'll see this is a common route from the ER to the Golgi apparatus to the cell surface. And these guys will oftentimes actually kind of like winch their way and kind of climb along the cytoskeleton as they go from one place to the next, next uh, carting their particular cargo. And we can also put other stuff inside of them. These are kind of cooler, where lysosomes are like mini stomachs, where these guys are full of enzymes. So these enzymes, if you just let them loose inside of your cell, uh, that's not going to be good because they digest stuff. They're enzymes. They break stuff down. These are enzymes that are not the happy-go-lucky, let's build stuff enzymes. These are like, let's destroy stuff. And so we keep them packaged up safe in the lysosome where they can't terrorize the villagers, if you will. But we talked about that you can merge vesicles with other stuff. So I can merge that lysosome with another structure that contains something like maybe a bacteria that I ingested, you know, that I ate. And now I want to destroy it, break it down, get energy from it, eat it. And so I can merge this lysosome and now these enzymes can come out to play. And so their partner for playing unwillingly uh, and unfortunately for it would be the bacteria and they can dismantle the bacteria and then we can use that dismantling to provide energy for the cell. You can also do this with worn out organelles. So if like you've got a mitochondria that's just not quite up to snuff anymore, uh, you can just go ahead and throw it with the lysosomes and let them tear it up and you can recycle if you will. Uh, peroxisomes have a somewhat similar function. These guys just have hydrogen peroxide in them. If you've ever used this antiseptically, you can put it on cuts and it gets all bubbly. Uh, and so the whole purpose for that is it's breaking stuff down. It works well with organic materials uh, where it will react with them and then we get byproducts of water and oxygen. But because this is reactive, we don't want this free in our cells, just roaming around, just like you should not be drinking hydrogen peroxide. Uh, if you do, consult a physician immediately. Uh, but if you do that, it's going to damage your body because it's very reactive. So we once again sequester it in this vesicle. We can always merge it with whatever we want to mess up. You know, it's kind of like the, the muscle, if you will. Uh, so you can bring that guy along and have it take care of something. And so it can help break down things like toxins. Uh, I believe it has a part in breaking down alcohol. So it can be used to serve a variety of functions, but it's fairly destructive. So we want to make sure it never gets loose in the cell where it can go around and mess with our proteins that we need, our enzymes that we need, and do some serious damage. And so these are all different types of vesicles. Now if we kind of take a step up from a vesicle, we can get to a vacuole. Now a vacuole is just generally going to be larger, and sometimes they're a bit more specialized. So usually when people think of vacuoles, they think storage, and that is pretty true. Uh, we'll have food vacuoles a lot in animal cells where that's where the bacteria would be like waiting because you'd wrap the bacteria when you ingest it, you'd wrap it up in your membrane. So there'd be a membrane around the bacteria and then you just merge a lysosome, a peroxisome with the food vacuole and then break it down. But you can also use what's called a contractile vacuole which kind of squeezes and for certain cells like water wants to come in and so they can swell and retaining water is bad even for a cell. And so they will use these contractile vacuoles to pump some of the water out to make sure that they're okay. Uh, in plants, you'll see that they do a lot of storage with vacuoles, but that's more so a plant thing than an animal thing. Uh, plant cells don't usually have as much long-term storage that they're doing specifically using these vacuoles. Uh, but that is one of their tasks as well as holding stuff while it's, like we said before, been being digested or being moved somewhere else but these tend to just be larger structures. You know, the vacuole is bigger than when you're talking about vesicles. Now, the very last thing we've got for this section is centrosomes and centrioles. Here's the trick. Everybody, let's see if I can spell. Everybody has centrosomes, all right? Centrioles are only found in animal cells. Now, even without centrioles, the centrosome still does the job. So you don't need centrioles. The centrosome is just this region where we produce these microtubules, these cytoskeletal elements that are used for stuff like cell division. Now, in animal cells, we'll also have these centrioles there, which will just be these hollow tubes that are made of microtubules. So there's just a bunch of them that kind of form this cylindrical hollow tube. Uh, and so you'll have two of those. And they will essentially serve the same function as the centrosome. So you'll just see them both together because you can't see the region other than the tubules the microtubules, uh, but you can see the centrioles if you had a good enough microscope. They're a bigger structure.
And so in animal cells, if you look to where those microtubules are kind of radiating from, where they're coming from, if you see the centrioles, you know what type of cell it is. If you don't see those centrioles, you'll still make microtubules. You're not going to just die because you lack them. But you won't see that particular structure. You'll just see these microtubules kind of appearing from a region, but you won't see a big structure there that's making them appear. I hope that's good for you guys, and I'll see you guys soon as we wrap up the rest of the cell structures uh, with section 210, which will be about plants. See you soon.